Deciding how extensively to work up and report respiratory cultures is the worst. There are good guidelines on how to approach this, but in my experience, very few laboratories strictly follow these guidelines. That can be because of concerns about underreporting pathogens or about overreporting microbiota, and often the changes are a result of clinical staff asking us to report more and more and more. Today, we'll be talking with two guests about their study on how overreporting organisms from respiratory tract cultures can lead to overtreatment with antimicrobials. Welcome to Editors in Conversation. Please subscribe to this podcast and rate or review it. This podcast is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your co-host, JCM Editor-in-Chief Alex McAdam. Editors in Conversation is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. I hope you'll submit your next study to JCM, and if you do, you can get up to 50% off the publication fee if you are a member of ASM. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Ellie Beal. Ellie is an editor of JCM and a clinical microbiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Ellie, how are you doing? Pretty good. Excited to talk to our guest today. Good. Our first guest is Dr. Sarah Parker, who is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Children's Hospital Colorado. Sarah is also the medical director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. Sarah, thank you for joining us. So pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to highlight this topic. I hope the discussion will move the field forward. I'm sure it will. I'm also happy to welcome Dr. Andrea Prinzi. Andrea is a clinical microbiologist who formerly worked in the clinical microbiology lab at Children's Hospital Colorado. She completed a PhD in clinical and translational science and is now an infectious disease medical science liaison with BioMary U. Andrea, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. We are going to be talking about a paper that the two of you have in press at JCM, and the title of the paper is The Impact of Organism Reporting from Endotracheal Aspirate Cultures on Antimicrobial Prescribing Practices in Mechanically Ventilated Pediatric Patients. I particularly like this paper <laughs> because it's right at the intersection of clinical microbiology and antimicrobial stewardship. So Sarah, let's start with you. Give us the big picture. What infection are clinical staff trying to diagnose when they send an endotracheal culture from a child who is mechanically ventilated? I think that that is actually part of the problem. So oftentimes tracheal aspirates are sent, but when, when clinicians are trying to look at, at, at pneumonia, either community acquired pneumonia or ventilated associated pneumonia, uh, sometimes they're just looking for a reason for a fever. They're looking for tracheitis. They might be doing surveillance, for example, on a patient who is thermoregulated. And all of this changes the pretest probability and makes it really problematic to, to understand these uh, results. Hmm. And kind of following up on that, Sarah, how accurate are endotracheal cultures really for the diagnosis of lower respiratory tract infections? So I don't really think that a positive tracheal aspirate culture means a patient has a lower respiratory tract infection. Um, I think the question really is when someone clinically has a, a lower respiratory tract infection, uh, is it useful to use a tracheal aspirate to find the causative organism? So I think doing surveillance cultures, for example, in those situations where there's not respiratory changes, is it, it, it's not predictive that there's something going on in the lower respiratory tract. Um, but if there is something going on in the lower respiratory tract, you know, is a tracheal aspirate a good specimen to try to know the, the pathogen? And we don't really know the answer to that exactly. I tried to re-review the literature on this topic. Um, first, it's very limited, but it's also really Hample, hampered um, by the variability in practice. So a trach aspirate at my hospital is not the same as, as a trach aspirate at your hospitals. None of us use the test the same way, which makes comparing the literature or putting uh, tracheal aspirates into national guidance super difficult. Um, I think to understand this, it's really important to set the stage and discuss the, the life of a tracheal aspirate. A lot of times on stewardship, we'll discuss this with the clinicians and they're, they're uh, really surprised how variable this process is. Um, so first, the test is ordered, and it can be ordered for so many different reasons, like concern, again, for ventilator-associated pneumonia, to just changes in secretions in a patient, to um, surveillance, to difficulty with expedition, to fever, to fever alone. And why it's ordered can, again, change that pretest probability. 
And then how the test is obtained is also a big black box. So um, that'll influence the results. So if you're looking for a quantitative result, it'll impact it more. But um, for example, do you send the initial mucus plug? Do you clean things out and then go deeper and get a, you know, what's maybe a better, deeper specimen? Do you instill saline? If you do instill saline, does your lab know? Because that's obviously going to dilute the result. Are you using inline suctioning, which is much more prone to be colonized? Um, so all those things are going to influence the, the, the result. And then once the specimen reaches the lab, there's not really any cap regulation, unlike sputums, where there's some rejection criteria on how it's handled. So everything from the gram stain through identification, through reporting, through susceptibilities is different lab to lab to lab. And these operating procedures are essentially home built. And MALDI has made that even more complicated. Um, so a lot of the literature acts like this is a standardized process that all of us understand, and it really doesn't. So one paper can be, if it were implemented in another center, is completely different um, because of how the things are handled uh, at all those different stages. So lots of variability. Is what Sarah, have you ever considered a career in clinical microbiology? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I could do it over, I might do that. that awesome. <laughs> I love microbiology. Awesome. <laughs> There's a reason we're such good friends. <laughs> yeah, wow. So, I did work in a micro lab for a lot of years, but basic science. So. Gotcha. <laughs> so, given all of that variability and kind of lack of standardization, uh, what was really the main question you were looking to answer with this study? Yeah, so as an ID doctor and then particularly as a steward, I find trachelaspirates really frustrating. Um, so one moment, moment, I find myself encouraging the team to narrow to the results. Uh, and that's I'm kind of reinforcing that that result means something when really I know it maybe doesn't. Uh, and then the next moment, I'm encouraging them not to treat those rare colonies of the non-lactose fermenter that were reported. Uh, and that's I'm kind of contradicting the advice that I might have given like the day before. And I just find it really frustrating. Like I feel like we just do the test and then try to figure out what we want to do around it and then just do that. And it, like in the end, it's not really perfectly uh, helpful or informative. Um, we know that uh, clinicians will often just, you know, latch on to things that grow and want to treat them. And who can blame them? These are the sickest of the sick patients. Um, and so it's a lot, a lot of times a fear driven result. And so I often feel like just getting a tracheal aspirate alone in itself leads to more antibiotic use. Um, so Andrea's second paper on this topic in JAMA Network looked at this and did find a correlation between the number of tracheal aspirates and antibiotic use. So in this study, we wanted to take the next step and evaluate if organism reporting impacted antimicrobial use. And again, had to do this at a single center because no center does these things the same. Um, and so to be clear, we have a fantastic lab and a robust stewardship program and very stewardship conscious providers. So our results are probably like the tip of the iceberg, like it could be a lot worse at other centers. Thank you, Sarah. And, and Andrea, we heard a lot from Sarah about the variability in specimen collection and clinical criteria for collecting a specimen. But let's peel back the cover here and talk about the lab-to-lab -lab variability. You, you two, along with some other folks, did a study that was published in JCM in 2021, and you looked at how clinical, uh, clinical laboratories and pediatric institutions differ in how they work up these cultures. Can you give us a summary of that? Sure. Yeah, this was a, uh, a survey study of 73 pediatric microbiology labs across the United States. And uh, what we did was we asked them about all of their processes associated with these endotracheal aspirate cultures from start to finish. So things like uh, how is this processed when it comes to your laboratory, gram staining, plating, organism identification, and then ultimately susceptibility testing. And like Sarah's alluded to a ton here, um, we saw just variability across the board. I think, you know, we expected variability, but way more than we thought we would see. Uh, things like, you know, 20 some odd percent of laboratories are using rejection criteria for these specimens. But then when we asked about the specifics of those criteria, there was a ton of variability there. Or, um, you know, the findings for organism identification were really interesting. So for example, 43% of laboratories said, you know, we would report 
Uh, we would identify and report Pseudomonas aeruginosa every time, regardless of what was seen in the gram stain or the quantity of the organism in culture. And then 57% of labs said, oh, it would depend on a variety of things. And those variety of things were variable, <laughs> you know. So we just saw variability just everywhere all throughout this. And uh, we had a free response section that I really loved because we saw these um, same themes keep popping up around uh, things like clinician pressure uh, to report the results from these specimens in a certain way. And so a lot of commentary around how laboratorians often feel a lot of pressure to work these up according to clinician preferences. And because, you know, there are some recommendations for working these up, available, but there really aren't any firm guidelines. They feel um, pretty unsupported in changing their process for these cultures mm -hmm. um, and that they really feel like there's a need for some more formal guidelines and some support so that if they, you know, they have some data to bolster conversations with clinicians around changing their procedures, that would be really helpful. So th thanks, Andrea. So Sarah, kind of getting into the, the study, can you um, give us an overview of the design? Yeah, it was essentially a retrospective study uh, in 2019 at a single 450 bed pediatric hospital trying to determine if reporting of microbes that grow on a tracheal aspirate impacts antibiotic use. The study was very laboratory heavy, and so I'm going to let Andrea elaborate on the details of the uh, of the design from here, if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, I would love to touch on this more. I think this yeah. is one of the really special things about this study is that we um, had a really strong laboratory and perspective here. So we, like Sarah said, we were looking at patients that had endotracheal aspirate cultures collected and who were mechanically ventilated throughout 2019. And we did a lot of extensive chart review, not only for patient demographic data, but also for culture result data and antimicrobial prescribing data. And what's really unique about this study is that we collected data down to the isolate level for every single culture and every patient. And we really had not seen that done before. And to be honest, no offense to clinicians, I love you all, but I think if you're not a laboratorian, maybe you don't think that way. You, you're extracting results out of some database based on how they're getting pulled out because they were bracketed in the LIS that way or something. And this was really digging down into the whole whole context of the micro results and trying to understand what we were seeing. And so by uh, collecting data at the isolate level, we were really able to assess the appropriateness of reporting of every individual isolate and also look at the days of therapy that were associated with every isolate. So we could really try to determine if the way that isolate was reported had any sort of impact on these prescribing practices. And then uh, with a bunch of uh, different modeling, we were able to compare uh, days of therapy between these groups, which ultimately ended up being overreported isolates and concordant isolates. And Andrea, when you say concordant, uh, the, the sort of gold standard that you used was the Clinical Microbiology Procedures Handbook, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, so everything was compared to that. If they did what it said to do, it was concordant. If they did otherwise, it was not concordant. Just for those who haven't had the great pleasure of reviewing that procedure <laughs> in the handbook recently, can you give us the high points of how it's structured and, and what they suggest reporting? You mean everybody's not reading these for fun? I read it in preparation for oh. this. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they are very complicated. So I like to break these up into three broad groups in my mind. Uh, please note they're more complicated than that. I encourage you to take a look at them if you have not, um, if you're really bored. But the first group would be organisms that we really should always report from these cultures. So that includes things like group A strep, uh, maybe group B strep from pediatrics really scary bugs like Bacillus anthracis, Cryptococcus neoformans, uh, things like that. And then the second group would be organisms that we pretty much always consider to be normal oropharyngeal flora or microbiota. I'll refer to it as mixed upper respiratory flora for this conversation because that's how we refer to it in our paper. Um, but these are organisms that we expect to see in this area all the time. They're really not known to cause disease in patients, and that includes organisms like uh, viridin strep, coagulase negative staph, uh, crini bacterium, non-pathogenic Neisseria, enterococcus, things like that. And then the third group is the one that gets pretty messy. These are the organisms that certainly could be pathogenic in a patient if given the opportunity, but could also be commensal organisms. And we have to think a little more critically about the significance of them by using other contextual pieces from our culture data. So um, 
the recommendations are to you know look at what was seen in the gram stain, how many polymorphonuclear cells were seen with that organism, the quantity of the growth of the organism in culture, and then also if it was predominant or not. So a little more um, contextual uh, discretion, if you will, is, is needed for that third kind of challenging group of organisms. Mm-hmm. So, Andrea, I'm assuming the laboratory reported exactly as indicated in the (laughs) Clinical Microbiology Procedures Handbook, right? Um, uh, But if not, uh, do you want to tell us how cultures were worked up and reported in the lab for this study? Yes, I will uh, preface this response by saying I'm very biased towards this lab. I worked there for many, many, many years, and it's full of wonderful, intelligent, well-trained individuals. So I would start with that. And like Sarah said, I would be very interested to see a study like this in a lab with not as much training in this particular area. I think it would be quite frightening. Um, So I would say that the standard operating procedure or SOP for this lab was really pretty well in line with the ASM recommendations and the way it's written. But I think if you've ever worked on these cultures or you've ever written one of these procedures, you know how complicated they can be and there's some ambiguity in there and it gets a little confusing. And so certainly uh, microbiologists are kind of sometimes forced to use their discretion and make a decision about a a scenario in terms of reporting or not. So two little caveats I'd like to mention there. The first would be uh, that the way MRF was defined in this particular procedure, I think actually led, uh, or mixed up a respiratory flora, I'm sorry, I call it MRF. it actually led to some overreporting for this study. So it was written as uh, three or more organisms that fall into this normal flora category. If you see three or more of those growing in similar quantities, call it mixed up or respiratory flora. And what I would find when we would train new microbiologists on this procedure was instances where you only had two, <laughs> you didn't have three or more, but both organisms fall in that category. You would, you would often see microbiologists, or, you know, bench text saying like, Oh no, there's not three, but it's like a coagnate staph, beard and strep, but, but there's not three. So I should definitely fully identify and report each one of those individually because I can't technically call it MRF or MRF respiratory. Um, and we saw this all the time. And so instead of, you know, saying, really, this is just normal flora, it just doesn't quite hit three different colony types or three different organism types, but it's still normal flora. Um, I think a lot of them feel irresponsible by not following that SOP as it's written. And so if there's less than three types, they would identify them. I'd also say, uh, Sarah mentioned this earlier, you know, Maldi-Toff is amazing, but it's brought a level of complication to the lab that I think we didn't anticipate. And uh, especially with younger microbiologists, I'd often see them, you know, really leaning on MALDI for identification rather than some of the spot testing. I think some of us uh, veterans prefer to use if possible. And so, you know, you you put something on MALDI top and you get this really uh, specific genus and species ID. And then you're like, well, why wouldn't I give this information to the clinician? I have this information. Why wouldn't I give it? And this is all based on the idea that if you give as much information as possible, the clinician will always do the right thing with it. Of course, their intention is to always do the right thing, but that they will act appropriately on the information. And so I see that kind of driving some of these instances as well, where you, okay, you've got this genus and species ID. Why wouldn't we just put that in the chart? We've done the work to identify it. So those are some of the deviations I think we had there. I mean, to to look at the other side of it, from the clinician's perspective, the lab reported it, the lab Mm -hmm. must be telling me it's important. Yes. Otherwise, why did they report it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Andrea, you you talked a little bit about the discretion that the microbiologists had in working up the cultures. A couple of things. Is there there more to say about that discretion? And also, um, were there instances in which clinicians called and said, tell me what what else is on the plate? Can you please work it up? So were there requests for additional workup on specific cultures? Yes. So uh, there's actually quite a bit of discretion of, allowed or afforded to uh, the microbiologists in terms of how these cultures get worked up. And just a side note on that, that's one of my favorite things about clinical microbiology is we're not just plopping things on an instrument, walking away and never thinking about it again. There's a lot of decision making that happens in micro. There's a lot of complexities around how we read cultures. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Um, but certainly, like like I said earlier, there's of course, a procedure, and it is to be followed as closely as possible, but there will always be scenarios where um, there's some deviation based on tech discretion. Uh, yes, we 
we did see clinicians calling back and requesting identification on some of these organisms. And I can elaborate on that a bit more um, in terms of what we did with those in the study. Um, but it is certainly something that happens. So if we give kind of a general ID, um, depending on what was going on clinically, the, the clinician would often call back and ask for further identification. Mm -hmm. so, I'll, I'll just weigh in there. I think clinicians really like if you, if, if you report a non-lactose fermenter example, for example, I think clinicians, you know, will really tend to call and want more information. Yeah. 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 Um, so you, you kind of touched on this, Andrea, about the dis concordance versus discordance, but can you kind of outline that one more time? Because you guys spent a lot of time discussing this in the paper, and I think it's a really important point when we get into what the actual data showed. Yes. Um, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we took those ASM recommendations and we put them into flow charts so that we could sort of think through them because they are very complicated. Um, and then, like I said, we we looked at every uh, culture down to the isolate level. So essentially went line by line for every individual isolate and compared that to what was seen in the gram stain associated with that culture. So that means, you know, was that organism seen in the gram stain? How much of it was there? And were there polymorphonuclear cells as well as epithelial cells, the quantities of those? And then we uh, considered the growth and predominance of that organism in culture in the context of everything else that was reported. So really looking at these as you would if you were a microbiologist reading the culture. Um, and again, that's why we didn't just extract data from a database. We actually chart reviewed all of the culture report data so we could do this. Um, and so then once we had these, you know, individual isolate uh, data points, we could look at the gram stain, look at the culture result and decide if according to our flow charts, they belonged in the overreported category or if they were concordant. Uh, we also pulled in another clinical microbiologist and did a like an adjudication process for this to ensure that we were both interpreting these flow charts in a similar way and then assigning isolates uh, to groups in a similar way as well. And let's go back to those organisms that were worked up by clinical request. I noticed that those were omitted from the analysis. How was that decision made to, to leave those out? So for the purpose of this study, we were really trying to, to really focus on how we could design these methods so that the days of therapy where we're seeing were most accurately reflect, reflecting the behavior based on what was reported in the culture. Um, so we wanted to look at what did the lab originally report? And what was the action that was taken from that? Um, I think understanding, I think, you know, we, Sarah and I both feel that understanding why a clinician calls down and adds an identification or susceptibility report is really important. Uh, but for the purpose of this study, we thought it would muddy the waters a bit. I will say that's a really important quality metric to consider if you're doing any sort of tracheal aspirate intervention in the lab, because if you, uh, you know, start doing like specimen rejection or something where you report less or maybe not so granular uh, detail in the, the report, are all the clinicians just calling and requesting it anyway? Like that's something that's really important to understand. But for what we wanted to do here, um, it added a layer of behavioral complexity that I, uh, we felt would, would muddy things up a bit. So we excluded those. Thank you. Sarah, mm -hmm. One of the important things that you guys looked at was the antibiotic days of therapy. Um, how was that determined? And and importantly, how did you decide what may, what constituted an excess day of therapy? Yeah, and um, definitely people could argue with the definitions we use, but again, we we had to you know come up with something very standard a priori. So antimicrobial use was considered excess if it was more than seven days for ventilator associated pneumonia and more than five days for tracheitis. And, Tracheitis is like this nebulous thing. Don't know what to do with it, really. But we, we assigned five days for that one uh, for organisms that were con like reported in a concordant manner. For, uh, for, for organisms that should not have been reported, then any days of therapy beyond the day of reporting was considered excess. Um, so, for example... If a patient has a fever and a tracheal aspirate is sent and the patient is started on ceftriaxone and then at day two, the lab reports, so day of reporting, the culture out as enterobacter and then the patient is changed to cefepime, 
and then gets 10 days of cefepime. If that enterobacter is considered overreported by ASM guidance, that would be 10 days of excess uh, 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 in that instance um, for tracheitis, if we're thinking about that. Um, while if it was appropriately reported, it would be considered five days of excess because we're only giving five days for tracheitis and they treated for 10 days. So, um, so that would be uh, uh, one example of how we do it. There's actually a great chart in the paper that goes through the different ways that we did this. And I'm going to let Andrea elaborate too. It's pretty confusing how it was done, but we thought long and hard about it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that we we try to be really thoughtful. I mean, I think everybody's trying to be thoughtful when they're doing their work, but I we try to be really thoughtful about how we calculated these. Um, you know, I when we were doing all this chart review, we really wanted we had a report date and time for every single isolate, and so that allowed us to look at you know forty eight hours either before or after this organism was reported. Were there antibiotics started? Uh, were those antibiotics something that could reasonably be used to treat this organism? If so, was the indication for treatment tracheitis or pneumonia? That's how we kind of determined, you know, was it targeting this organism? And actually, to take that a step further, um, we really dug into the notes to look for explicit around why this antibiotic was being used. And we got lucky many times. Like, there was the day that I uh, was chart reviewing and saw a text that said, I'm treating for coagnate staph tracheitis. I was like, slam dunk. We go no further. <laughs> you know, like this is, <laughs> if we found things like that, it was obviously very clear that that was being targeted. Um, if we didn't find something that specific, then we used our uh, stewardship dashboard, which has the indications for each antibiotic built in, and then would use the indication of tracheitis or pneumonia to help us determine if that was truly targeted. And then the way we calculated days of therapy, we did that in two different ways. Um, the first was to look at the days of therapy that happened after the organism was reported, because we felt like that was most suggestive of behavior as a result of that reporting, right? So um, we looked at, we called that post-reporting days of therapy. But then just to make sure we weren't introducing any bias there, we also had a total DOT. So that would be from uh, the date and time of the first dose to the date and time of the last dose, and that included empiric therapy. So we did total days of therapy and post-reporting days of therapy and kind of you know, added all those numbers up and considered all those things together. Yeah, One unique I, thing about our center too is that we, we have mandatory indications for all antibiotics. It's a hard stop in the medical record. And so that's really helpful because ICD-10s, particularly for tracheitis, are uh, ventilators. So to tracheitis are not very good. So that, that was super helpful. Hmm. Yeah, I got to say that figure in the paper, I may have looked at it more than once, <laughs> but it was very clear, you know, after the fourth time, I, I, I'm totally on board with everything that you guys did. And I remember thinking while reading the paper, I cannot imagine what this spreadsheet looked like. It's right? a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so well I had done. the same thought. <laughs> this is, you guys, this is literally Andrea Prinzi and Sarah Parker's brain just like exploded. <laughs> into on a paper, but then like cleaned up by the wonderful editors at JCM. Yeah. Like we, it's <laughs> pretty psychotic, um, but also, you know, I think we were just trying to really get our answer here. <laughs> yeah, it JCM, was. JCM, where we'll clean up your mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there, there's, there it is. All right, so with that really detailed intro on the study methods and a new tagline for JCM, um, <laughs> Andrea, do you want to uh, talk about how often uh, isolates were overreported in tracheostomy versus endotracheal tube cultures? Because I was kind of surprised there was there was a notable difference. Yes, uh, interestingly, so isolates from the cultures of patients with tracheostomies for which there were about 310 of those, uh, 25 or only 8% were considered overreported. So the tracheostomy group looked pretty darn good. Um, for isolates that grew from cultures of patients with endotracheal tubes, there were a total of 769 of those and 227 or 29% were considered overreported. So that endotracheal tube group was uh, much worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What do, you, what do you make of that, the two of you? What do you think might be the cause or explanation for the difference between the two sources? Sarah, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Uh, 
Sure, I'll go first. Um, yeah, so I think we differ a little bit on this. So I, I actually think further study is needed on that because I really wonder if uh, kids with tracheostomies, uh, you know, essentially have a thick veneer that is going to meet ASM criteria. Like you could maybe do a trach aspirate when they're well, and it might meet ASM criteria for reporting. And thus, it, there was a lot more concordant in that group, which allowed us to, to um, you know, say that, that that therapy was warranted. So um, I'm not so sure. I, I think that we need more study in that population. I should probably take a politically correct approach like Sarah there. I have very, like, totally anecdotal strong feelings about this. Um, I feel like in the lab, you know, our tracheostomy patients, we knew them all. Like, they came through all the time. I feel like they're very known to our clinicians. I I personally just had this sense that maybe, and Sarah, I think she knows from the clinical side, so she's probably like, you're totally wrong on this, Andrea. Uh, but like that maybe they're more known to the clinicians and maybe there's a little more discretion around when these are ordered and sent to the lab and maybe the specimens are better, although I, I dare almost not use that word. But, um, you know, or like we're, we're into tracheal tube specimens. I feel like there's, you know, you've got this wide range of different types of patients coming in and sometimes they're, are they surveillance or like, did this patient just have a, a fever and nothing else happening? Or like, I just, there's a lot more um, that sets these specimen types or cultures up for failure in that group, I feel like. So it's not Very. because there's excellent guidelines for tracheostomy. No, it's not that. <laughs> it's not that. Yeah, it's definitely not that. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'd really love to see, you know, a study where kids, because essentially in those kids, it's almost always tracheitis that they're looking for, not really a pneumonia. And, um, and I would really like to see the study where they just do good sort of trait care for a couple of days before. And I think my sense would be they'd probably do the same as they do with the antibiotics. Are you saying that you don't believe in tracheitis? <laughs> <laughs> Way to put her on the spot, Alex. No, that yeah. That's not a fair question. That's not a fair question. Um, Blink twice, Sarah. Back- <laughs> Let's get back to the overreporting. Andrea, tell us uh, what species tended to be overreported the, the most. Okay, so we've got our, our top, I'll give you the top five groups. Uh, the first were organisms belonging to the Veerd and Strep group. Uh, we had second was coagulase negative staph. Ugh, that pains me. Third was Enterococcus faecalis. Fourth was staph aureus that included MRSA and MSSA. And then uh, fifth was yeast, not candida albicans. And most of these were just other uh, candida species, not albicans. Usually people stick with like top three. Oh, I wanted to give you all five. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, kind goodness. of a rose gallery of non-pathogens, though. Yeah, and that's, I loved, I loved when we pulled those out and, and made that figure. I was like, if you do, if you take nothing else from this study, look at that low hanging fruit right there. Mm-hmm. Look at that coagnate staff and how many days of therapy we saw dedicated to those coagnate staff isolates and like, oh, if we could just clear those out right away, that would be great. Or the weird and strap, you know, yeah. um, I loved that that's kind of what, what made its way out of the data. I thought that was really neat because yeah. that's what I was hoping nice. to see. <laughs> Nice. So, uh, Sarah, with all this over-reporting, uh, can you talk a little bit about how much over-treatment occurred uh, as a result and how much of that over-treatment was associated um, with the over-reporting? Yeah. So, for context, there were about 450 patients and about 800 endotracheal um, specimens and about 1,080 organisms. And the data was analyzed, again, like Andrea said, on the organism level. But before any fancy modeling in the in the endotracheal tube group, uh, we observed 472 excess days of therapy there. Andrea actually worked really hard in learning all this modeling and honestly kind of outgrew me at this point. And I think that's maybe the goal of most mentors. <laughs> so I'm going to let her discuss the deal to details from here. He, I mean, oh my gosh, working with Andrea was, uh, it was so hard to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Sarah. I think that's a Leonardo da Vinci quote. I think Leonardo da Vinci said something about like outgrowing your mentor, which I'm, I'm not sure I'll ever do. But I took a stab at modeling here. Um, with the help of some statisticians. But we, after we uh, 
you know, built our model and then adjusted for significant covariates, we saw organism overreporting was associated with a nearly threefold higher rate of post-reporting days of therapy as compared to concordant reporting. Um, and when we looked at the total days of therapy, we saw a greater than threefold higher rate of total uh, days of therapy in the overreported group as compared to the concordant group. So pretty significant, interesting findings there. Thank you. And I, I apologize. You may have said this. And, uh, my son just came in the house, so I was distracted for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> Did overtreatment also occur in the patients whose cultures were reported concordant with the recommendations in the handbook? Yes, uh, there were 103 days of excess days of therapy in the concordant group. And of course, that doesn't mean that the five to seven days of treatment that we allowed in tracheitis and, and uh, pneumonia was warranted per se, but we had to come up with standard definitions um, in order to measure this. So, but yes, there was overtreatment. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, Andrea, so looking at overreporting, overtreatment, what about the patient characteristics? So, any associations there that you pulled out? Yeah, there were several interesting ones. Um, we did see that our youngest age group, so this was uh, zero to 27 days, they were significantly more likely to have overreported isolates from their cultures as compared to the, the older age groups. Um, patients without co uh, complex or underlying conditions at admission uh, were actually significantly more likely to have overreporting from their overreported isolates from their cultures. Uh, patients with longer admissions as well as longer durations of ventilation were all significantly more likely to have overreported isolates. And then uh, with respect to gram stain results, cultures with gram stains that had less than few polymorphonuclear cells documented or no organisms detected, uh, those cultures were significantly more likely to have overreported organisms as well. Hmm. And let me ask both of you, what do you think might have been the cause of some of those associations? What are your thoughts about what might be underlying that? I think for the, the very young age group, I think that, and I think Sarah and I probably have very different perspectives on this, which is what I love about this. You get this, like, these two very different, I, right? Um, so, I mean, neonates are so complicated, complex, and I and challenging patient population. And I think, you know, the literature is really um there's been several good papers that have come out that have really demonstrated a lot of excessive use of these cultures in that population. And I don't know if that's because they're really hard to figure out or, or what. So I, I don't know if often these are getting um, sent for reasons maybe that don't suggest necessarily tracheitis or pneumonia or what's going on there. Um, I don't know, Sarah, what do you, what are your thoughts on neonates? Well, I also wonder if there is, is a lab phenomenon in that neonates are less likely to be colonized with all sorts of stuff. So they, the, the, it might be the neonate that's going to fall into the category where they have the coag negative staph and the strep viridans and the trach aspirin. And it's not the three. So ended up uh, overreported because they're, they're, they don't have as wide a variety of flora that would, flora that would show up on a trach aspirin. And so these are all things that I think would be interesting to look into, but yeah. Yeah. And then I think, you know, for the, we touched on this a bit already, but the, the patients that arrive without any existing conditions, you know, I just, I just have this sense that patients that are a little more known to the system, perhaps are just handled differently. And I don't know if that is reflected in the way, you know, when cultures are collected or how they're collected. And if that then reflects in the microbiology results, I'm not sure, but I feel like it has something to do with that. I just don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sure. Thanks. So broadly speaking then, Sarah, um, what does your study really tell us uh, about the role of the clinical microbiology laboratory and, and you know, what role it plays in it's, antimicrobial stewardship? Yeah, back to that discussion earlier of, um, you know, the clini clinicians think that if you're giving them information, it's important. And then I think the lab is thinking that they need to give the, the, the clinicians all the information and that the clinicians will then decide what's important. And there's just so much out there and so much new technology. So I think the lab really does have to take a role in making sure what they're reporting is likely to be clinically significant. And we're seeing this more and more with all the new testing that's coming uh, on. Um, we actually have micro rounds every day here and we have this fantastic lab and we interact with them a lot and we help them deploy new testing. We're, um, uh, 
hopefully going to roll out some rejection criteria here soon. It's in discussion uh, currently. Um, but I really do think the lab needs to, to do more to help um, in this area. Um, but clinicians need to support the lab. <laughs> mm-hmm. Andrea, I know this is an area that you're particularly interested in. What would you like to add? Alex, I love that you're asking me this because you know it's my soapbox. So I promise <laughs> I won't diatribe for the next like 10 minutes, but I do have some things to we'll say. Cut you off. Okay, but yeah, give me the signal. Give me the signal. Um, I just think, I think that this study is such a great example of how the clinical team and laboratorians can collaborate to do some meaningful work that helps us all, right? So I'm fortunate enough to have been able to work with Sarah for the last like 10 plus years and other clinicians at Children's who have truly taught me so much, you know, working and training with them has made me a better microbiologist. It's really shaped who I am. I mean, so much of what I am today is because of the clinicians that I I learned from and trained with at Children's. And I just think that those kinds of relationships are super important. I also think that kind of, you know, as, as Sarah mentioned, as we continue to see the role of clinical microbiologists change and all of our staffing issues and just the way the lab is changing over time, I think we, you know, and in addition to the introduction of these really amazing diagnostic technologies that are wonderful, but require so much thought when it comes to implementation and, you know, um, interpretation of results. Like we should start really critically thinking about the role that clinical laboratorians play in stewardship initiatives, quality improvement, uh, research, things like that. I mean, of course we know the value that they bring to bench work. Like they, it literally, things would not move forward without them, but what other roles can they play? They certainly have a tremendous skill set and a, a perspective that few others have. Like, how do we continue to harness that so that it's advantageous for everyone? And I also just think maybe, you know, we should get really creative with respect to training the new generation of laboratorians, like incorporating some level of maybe formal research training in their curriculum and, and helping kind of bridge this gap, maybe help really reinforce these clinical laboratory stewardship, you know, relationships moving forward. I mean, I obviously think the lab has an enormous role to play and a lot of the work that I do really emphasizes that, but I also love our clinician colleagues and I just like think everybody should just, you know, be done. Well, thank you very much. We'll have that be the last word. Thank you, Andrea, (laughs) for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Sarah, for joining us as well. Thank you. Ellie, great to see you. I look forward to seeing what you choose for us to talk about in the next episode. Yes, it'll be a surprise. (laughs) (laughs) To me too. (laughs) And thank you for listening to the episode.